Hello. I'm Reggie Tucker Seeley, Vice President of Health Equity at Zero, the End of Prostate Cancer. And I'm joined today by Dr. Brandon Mahal, a physician scientist at the University of Miami, Miller School of Medicine, and the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Mahal treats prostate and genitourinary cancers. And Dr. Mahal um, obtained his Doctor of Medicine a degree with honors at Harvard Medical School. He completed internal medicine internship at Harvard Medical School's Brigham and Women's Hospital and completed residency in radiation oncology um, in the Harvard Radiation Oncology Program. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Mahal to introduce his team members. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Tucker Seeley. I'm again, Dr. Brandon Mahal. I'm a prostate cancer radiation oncologist at the University of Miami, where I also serve as Assistant Director of Community Outreach and Engagement and, and Vice Chair of Research of the Department of Radiation Oncology. Thank you very much for having me. I'd also uh, like, like to introduce my colleague who I work with in the Office of Community Outreach and Engagement, Paco Castellon. He's the Director of our programs and, and we'll be sharing some insights today. Great. Well, um, Dr. Mahal, I'm so excited that you're here today. Um, you and I had a conversation about your the paper that we're going to discuss today. And during that conversation, I realized you were dropping some really, um, some gold nuggets that I really wanted to share with our prostate cancer community. So, so we decided to record a, a conversation about um, um, focused on your paper. So, so we'll start with just talking about that paper. So in 2018, uh, you conducted a research study uh, to investigate prostate cancer specific mortality by Gleason score and race. And you use data from the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results or SEER prostate um, active surveillance and watchful waiting database. Now your paper sparked a conversation in the prostate cancer community about what Gleason 6 might mean for African-American men compared to other groups. So can you start by telling us a little bit about what motivated you to conduct this specific analysis, focus on prostate cancer mortality by Gleason score and race, and what you what specific questions you and your colleagues were attempting to answer? Yeah, thanks very much for the question. And again, it's an honor and privilege to be here to share some of this information. So back, back in uh, 2018, actually this was shortly after 2017 when the, the idea came about, um, there, uh, it was me and, and a few of the other co-authors were at a, a prostate cancer conference, Prostate Cancer Foundation, where we were talking a lot about uh, lower risk prostate cancer, lower risk meaning Gleason 6, low PSA, small tumors. And I'll get more into the Gleason score a little bit later, uh, but this is just to say we were you know, discussing treatments for low risk cancers and an emerging standard of care, which is now considered the gold standard uh, in most countries is active surveillance for low risk cancers, including Gleason 6 cancers. And active surveillance is, is a form of management that doesn't involve treatment, doesn't involve removing the, the prostate with surgery, with radical prostatectomy, or treating with radiation, which is typically the treatment for what's a localized prostate cancer that's confined to the prostate, all right? And what we've seen over the last decade or so, uh, as, as new evidence has come out to support this approach, is that there are certain countries, especially in Europe, where 90% of men who come in with Gleason 6 cancer get active surveillance. In the United States, that's much less, but around 50% by now. But uh, at the same time, there was evidence coming out of a group from Johns Hopkins University, led by a researcher named uh, Ted Schaefer, Dr. Ted Schaefer, that showed men who were initially diagnosed with Gleason 6 cancer, who went on to get surgery, when you compared white men to black men in those cohorts who ident self-identified as either white or self-identified as black, that the black men were more likely to be harboring underlying more aggressive cancers that were a higher Gleason score, seven, eight, nine, or 10, or that the cancer itself was bigger, okay, a larger, a larger tumor than what was predicted before the surgery. And, and those men were two to, two to three times as likely to have those adverse outcomes. And so that, uh, that result had trickled into um, you know, a lot of hesitancy around active surveillance for black men for understandable reasons, because there is a concern 
that black men had more aggressive tumors when they're coming in diagnosed with Gleason 6 disease. But there were no large scale studies that could show a survival difference uh, because a lot of these studies were done in, 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 uh, in groups of 200 men. And for this kind of cancer, you need hundreds of thousands of men on a study to be able to find a, a difference in survival uh, across Gleason score. And so we um, had access to some data uh, with nearly 200,000 men at the time, including over 30,000 black men, where we could make this assessment, where we could ask this question and get an answer. And so that was really what motivated uh, the study is, is one, that there's a, a new treatment approach for um, low risk cancers. I shouldn't really call it new, there's decades of evidence, but it's a new standard of care uh, called active surveillance for low risk cancers. However, you know, there have been studies that have shown that black men may be uh, more at risk for harboring un more aggressive disease. So we wanted to evaluate whether or not we saw differences in, in survival outcomes in a yeah. big, big study. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm looking forward to really diving into that sort of classification around black men. But, but before we get there, um, you start the paper by stating that the Gleason score is the best independent predictor of prostate cancer outcomes. Can you briefly describe what the Gleason score is? Yes. Yeah, so in terms of the way uh, clinicians and, and healthcare providers make decisions on treatment for prostate cancer, there are you know, three main factors that we look at. First, we like to look at um, how big the cancer is and whether or not it's confined to the prostate or it's spread beyond the prostate. When the cancer is localized within the prostate, we call it localized prostate cancer. When it's outside of the, of the prostate, it's oftentimes metastatic or locally advanced. Then we like to look at the PSA, which is a blood test, the prostate specific antigen. And the, and the third thing that we like to look at is the Gleason score. Okay, and the Gleason score is what the, the when a biopsy is done to the prostate, and a cancer is detected, what that cancer looks like under the microscope to a pathologist's eyes. And um, when you look at those different factors, there's the Gleason, the PSA, and the size of the tumor, the Gleason score tends to be the uh, factor that is the most prognostic, meaning that it gives us the most information about what potential outcomes there are for any individual patient. So it's the, it's, you know, it's the, the factor that we put the most weight in, although we take all the other factors into account. And again, the Gleason score is just what the, what the cancer looks like under the microscope. And it's a little bit confusing because the lowest grade cancer starts at a six, a Gleason six. Then there's intermediate risk cancers. Those are Gleason seven. And then eight, nine, and 10 are all considered high risk uh, uh, prostate cancers. And so that, that is what I mean by that. Uh, it's the most, you know, prognostic factor of, of the factors that we use. Okay. And so the, the results of your paper showed that racial disparities were greatest in that low grade Gleason 6 disease. And so you mentioned, you know, that's where, that's where the scoring starts. So that is the, the, the lowest score is Gleason 6. But your results showed that um, for low-grade Gleason 6 disease in which Black men were twice as likely to die from prostate cancer compared to non-Black men. So what are the implications of for research and for practice when a paper, you know, has these kinds of striking results, such large disparities in what is considered low-risk prostate cancer? Yeah, thank you. So um, there, you know, there, there are several implications. Um, first, is again, as you mentioned, we saw a, a twofold increased risk of, of death from prostate cancer in black men. That being said, the absolute uh, rates, meaning the rate of death at, at 10 years was low regardless of race. It was about 1% for white men and just over 2% for black men, okay? That being said, this study had short follow-up for prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is a slow growing cancer. Okay, and events such as a prostate cancer death may not occur until 15, 20 years after diagnosis. And, and basically the maximum amount of follow-up we had is 10 years here. So there could be bigger differences later on. So it, it's something that um, is, is an observation that we should definitely consider. 
And, and that's why it was published in, in, a real, in, a, in a journal that gets out there to the general readership. Mm -hmm. um, but what, it, what it's telling us is that when we see a Gleason 6 for Black men, we may not have the full story for various reasons. And that Black men with Gleason 6 disease may be at an increased risk of, of negative outcomes down the road. Okay, and there, there are things to do, you know, that we're going to get into that that can really reduce the chance of a negative outcome in the future. But that's basically what this study shows. It's an observation. Um, there's not a whole lot of, of uh, inferences we can make on what that observation means, but that it's a significant observation because, again, these are the men who can go on active surveillance and what it would suggest to, you know, clinicians is hey, is there maybe an increased risk for Black men who are going on active surveillance? And that's what the, the question that comes up when you see this observation. Yeah, and so, well, so we mentioned the, the topic of your, of your paper, and we didn't note that it was published in a, a very high-impact journal, so the Journal of the American Medical Association, um, or, or JAMA, which was why, you know, it did, you know, cause this um, um, significant discussion you know, in the prostate cancer community of these findings of, you know, these men with low grade disease were, as what black men with low grade disease had worse outcomes um, compared to, to white men. But, but those results didn't show the same disparity in Gleason 7 to 10, that is the intermediate to high risk men. So why do you think that was the case? Yeah, exactly. So um, the Gleason 7 to 10 uh, category, okay, all the men when we compared white versus black men who came in with intermediate to high risk cancers, there was no difference in outcomes. And it's most likely because once, once the cancers become intermediate to high grade, there's, you're, you're less likely to miss something that is more aggressive, because we're already classifying uh, the men who come in as having aggressive cancers. And so we're doing a good job of, of, you know, of, of dictating a prognosis of saying, OK, you know, these men uh, it, are, are not very likely to have more aggressive disease than what we predict. So it doesn't matter who's coming in, uh, white or black men, um, the, the outcomes are the same. And so when you get when you see um, more aggressive cancers, um, if you look at men who have the same kind of disease characteristics, outcomes tend to be the same. And the same has been seen in other studies with men with more advanced disease, with metastatic disease, who have been on, you know, randomized trials and who have been compared, that there's, there's little to no difference uh, by race uh, when you look at outcomes among men with more aggressive disease. Mm -hmm. So the issue here seems to be with this classification of Black men um, at with low grade Gleason Gleason six disease, so could the could there potentially be a misclassification issue in terms of you know that the black men that are classified as low grade Gleason six may not necessarily actually be Gleason six. Exactly, and that that is um, one of my leading hypotheses for what we're seeing, what that observation, what's driving that observation is misclassification, and I just want to take a moment to really explain what that is exactly. And so when, when men come in with a diagnosis or are getting worked up for prostate cancer, the, the routine process now is that there's a PSA blood test. Most often we're not really doing the digital rectal exam for screening purposes anymore. There, there's often, uh, that's often a part of the, the workup with a urologist, but it's usually a PSA and a man who's asymptomatic that ultimately leads to a prostate biopsy. And the, the standard uh, biopsy for uh, prostate cancer, standard uh, prostate biopsy takes 12 cores uh, from six from the right side of the prostate and 12 uh, and six from the left side of the prostate for a total of 12 cores. The, the area of the, pro it, it does a good job of sampling the prostate. Okay, this is like sticking needles in a bread loaf, so to speak, all right, and looking for nuts. It does a good job of sampling the general areas of the prostate, but one area that it tends to miss is what is called the anterior portion of the prostate, okay? So it misses this portion that's called the anterior gland. And what we know from studies, again, from that group in, in Hopkins uh, by Ted Schaefer, is that black men are more likely to harbor prostate cancer uh, in uh, harbor more aggressive prostate cancer than what's found on biopsy 
in the area of the anterior gland. And so, you know, just by, just by routine of the way, the way our tests have been developed, the way our biopsy uh, technique has been developed, it, it hasn't uh, been developed for what we're, you know, more likely to see in black men. And so a lot of black men are more likely to, to harbor that uh, underlying aggressive disease in the anterior gland. So there's an opportunity to miss the prostate cancer. Um, that's one big thing. The other big thing is that um, nowadays we use a lot of prostate MRI and, and that's a standard of care that um, helps us visualize the prostate and actually helps us visualize what areas of the prostate there may be cancer. And then what you can do after that, you get a prostate MRI, mm -hmm. the urologist can go and target those areas they see on the MRI. And what we know is mm -hmm. black men are less likely to get those diagnostic MRIs for prostate mm -hmm. cancer. So they're more likely to miss those tumor nodules that may be harboring more underlying aggressive disease. Mm -hmm. And so to, to, to take your bread analogy a step, a step further, you know, if you do the MRI, let's say you have the nut bread, it's easier to sort of look around the entire loaf, yep. to sort of see where you need to position uh, to pull those cores. Exactly. So when, yep. you do, when you do the MRI, you get the standard 12 core biopsy, but mm -hmm. also they'll target biopsies. So we, we know where the nut and the bread is located mm -hmm. and we'll mm -hmm. go and we'll target that lesion and take take. Uh, cancer from that lesion. And those lesions that show up on MRI are mm -hmm. most often the more aggressive cancers 90% of the time. Yep. Yep. Oh, wow. So I think sort of, you know, I imagine that this is going to be a continuing conversation, you know, within the prostate cancer community around, you know, getting this, this type of care to more Black men. Because as you said, Black men are less likely to have access to, to MRI um, uh, type of testing. So exactly. my my next question is a bit a bit statistical. So since we both are you know researchers, I'll throw a statistics question in here for you. So usually in statistical models, you know, in health and medical research, researchers will include you know control variables, and these control variables um, sort of help us um, um, include variables that might help us explain the association that we're finding. So are there any other factors that might help us sort of understand this association? And so sometimes, you know, we often include, you know, socioeconomic factors. So sometimes when we see these racial differences uh, in outcomes, they might be explained by socioeconomic factors. So we might include some socioeconomic um, variables. So what control variables did you include in this analysis? And then are there, and then how was socioeconomic status measured, measured in your study? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that question. And it, it's an important one to, to understand and, and to talk about. Again, you know, we try our best in research to, to isolate the variable of interest that we think, you know, may be associated with an outcome in this, in this study, that being race. And so, um, the, the, the other reason that this study is important um, and, and uh, a reason why it got published in, in uh, JAMA again is because it was also the first study coming out of this specific national database, SEER, mm -hmm. that included for the first time um, a validated socioeconomic status variable, which was called the Yost Index. And I'll explain what that includes. Um, it's basically a composite measure, all right? that is a, a county level measure. So it, it's taken from where the patients live, all right? It includes median household income, median home value, rent, uh, percent below poverty line, education index, and working class and percent unemployed. So all of those factors were combined into this one variable called the Yost index that allowed us to uh, control or adjust for potential socioeconomic status reasons for the adverse outcomes. Okay, so as, as best we can to try to isolate, you know, race from some of the socioeconomic status variables, which it honestly is an impossible task to completely isolate, but we do our best. Yeah. And so we use that. We also adjusted for uh, PSA blood level, as I mentioned, uh, and, and why it's important to separate that from the Gleason score. And we also adjusted for the size of the tumor in addition to age and, and uh, treatment type. So uh, as, as robust of adjustments as we can make uh, within the limitations of the data set, we made those. But yeah, this was, you know, this study was the first of its, 
from that data set that had a validated um, socioeconomic status variable that we could adjust for. Yeah. And so putting my putting my researcher hat on, I know that, you know, folks would say, well, you know, a place based measure of SES may not necessarily capture that individual level, you know, socioeconomic status and my and my pushback, given all of the things that that are captured in that measure that you described is I would imagine that given how segregated our neighborhood where we live, yeah. our neighborhoods are by those very factors that that you just described, I would imagine that those those do a pretty good job of of capturing the socioeconomic experience of the folks who lives that live in those areas. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the and the variable's been, you know, studied very well and has has been shown to to capture that information very well. Yeah. yeah. So my my last question is about um, whether your results suggest a specific pathway. So we've already we've talked a little bit about um, the the difference in sort of you know what the MRI captures, um, and so do you do your results suggest that there's a specific you know biologic or social pathway that might help explain these these differences between black and non-black men, or, or are you attributing it completely to this um, sort of not necessarily capturing? you know, the the more aggressive cancer in the anterior of the prostate that an MRI might capture? I'm going to give you a, a short answer and, and a long answer, and, okay. and I hope to explain myself. The short yeah. answer is that this study in isolation doesn't really give us the full, you know, full uh, answer. I think, I think more than anything, it tells us that there's probably a, a mixed picture, but I think it's largely driven by social factors. Okay, for example, access to um, access to high quality uh, prostate biopsies, access to MRIs, access to genomic tests, which I haven't discussed, that also help uh, determine what types of treatments uh, to give patients, including when when a Gleason score is low. I think those are the factors that are likely driving these findings more than anything, but we don't have enough information from this database to 100% to make that conclusion. That's just my leading theory. Now, that being said, I, I, want, I do want to take a step back and say that it's important to acknowledge that when you look at uh, patterns across populations, all right, in the U.S. and abroad, that men with West African ancestry specifically are more likely to develop prostate cancer about one, almost twofold increased risk of developing prostate cancer, 1.8 fold increased risk, and are more than twice as likely to die from, from prostate cancer. And when you compare some of those trends to all other cancers, including breast cancer and other major cancers that may behave similarly to prostate cancer, you don't see any other cancer that has that excess risk mm -hmm. of developing prostate cancer. And so I think we know pretty well that there are a lot of um, uh, social factors, including, you know, factors related to racism and structural racism, access to healthcare, that definitely lead to inferior outcomes for Black men with prostate cancer in the U.S. and other countries, okay? Um, I think that is, that there's some studies that I've been a part of that have really established that uh, fairly clearly. The, on the other side, however, there are, you know, some studies that suggests that there, there may be some ancestral characteristics that lead to an increased risk of developing prostate cancer mm -hmm. for men with West African ancestry, who a lot, you know, a lot of uh, men who self-identify as Black in the U.S. have West African ancestry. And so I think it's important to acknowledge there may be some ancestral component uh, mm -hmm. to raise awareness um, mm -hmm. and, and uh, specifically about PSA screening. And I think, you know, catching cancers early is, is what matters most. And, mm -hmm. and when you catch a cancer early, uh, in particular prostate cancer, the chance of curing it is above 95%. But when you catch it when it's later, when it's producing symptoms, it can be much more difficult to, to cure and contain. And so, you know, again, in this particular study, I think what's driving the findings is mostly social factors. That being said, if, you at, if we're looking at overall trends, um, or why, you know, there's excess uh, risk of, of Black men developing prostate cancer. I think it's both. And there's an interaction of those factors where, you know, stresses and chronic generations of stress can lead to what's called epigenetic risk, where, mm -hmm. you know, there's just an overall 
increased risk from both the environment and the way that the genes interact to produce an increased mm -hmm. risk of prostate cancer. And so it's something to be uh, very aware of. And I want to be sure I share that message yeah. and, and don't mm -hmm. just dilute it down to a, a yeah. simple answer. <laughs> well, and I and two, I think you've provided a great introduction to our our next conversation. Because as someone with West African ancestry, I am very curious about, you know, what the research shows in terms of risk for, for, for that population group. Um, and I, I look forward to continuing our conversation on, you know, the role of ancestry in helping us better understand the substantial disparities that we see in prostate cancer um, for, for Black and Brown men. Um, so um, just to, to sort of wrap up our conversation about, about your paper, so I mentioned that your paper was, was published in 2018 in JAMA. So that was a few years ago. Have there been any additional or follow-up studies to further evaluate current diagnostic processes, especially for Black men? And if so, are you, are you familiar with any of, those, of the results of those studies? Yeah, so there have been a couple of studies that, that I actually I participated in, in uh, some of the bigger ones. One of them was looking at uh, genomic risk scores for men across Gleason score by race. So for men with a Gleason 6, uh, Black men were more likely to harbor higher genet genomic risk scores in those tumors, very similar to the findings that were, were seen in this study. Okay, we, we, we did that study. Then another study looked at trends in use of active surveillance for men with low-risk disease. And lo and behold, Black men are less likely to receive active surveillance. And I think it's because they're is, um, you know, there's some hesitancy out there by providers and clinicians to offer active surveillance because there's a fear that um, there may be more underlying aggressive disease. Mm -hmm. That being said, I want to, I'm bringing those studies up to say that I think sometimes the results are, are conflated and, and that um, the, the real issue is making sure that when a man has Gleason 6 disease, that they've received the full world-class diagnostic workup that they can receive that is uh, dictated by standard of care, which includes a biopsy, an MRI, and, and uh, now uh, a rising test is the genomic risk score. And if you do all of those things and the Gleason score is still a six and you can confirm that there's low burden disease, then I think every man, regardless of race, should be offered active surveillance and, and, and it would be equally safe. But if you don't have that information, then you know, you're, you're, you're treating with limited information. Yeah. And I think that that's where we, we're gonna be headed to. And that's where the research is, is emerging right now is what if everybody receives the same diagnostic workup now, what's the risk? And my belief is it will be similar. So yeah. it's really important to, to have this information when you're going through a diagnosis to know that ask for an MRI, ask for genomic risk scores. And I know we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but that's, that's where we're headed. Yeah. So can you, can you say those, those three things that are, that are standards of care now so that, you know, the men listening who may have be at a Gleason six to sort of know what, what those, those three things are that they should be asking for as a standard of care. Um, if they are indeed categorized as, as a Gleason six. Exactly. So in addition to the prostate biopsy, which is, you know, has always been standard of care, then there's number two is the prostate MRI, which is now guideline approved standard of care. And the third thing is the genomic risk score. And that's also guideline approved to be used as standard of care. Okay. Um, and there's Medicare coverage for all of those. Different mm -hmm. other insurances will, will have various policies, but the MRI is almost always approved now. Great. Yeah. So, so now we want to turn the conversation to what you're doing at the Sylvester Cancer Center to address the disparities that we see in prostate cancer. Um, and so we know that your center, and so we'd like to pull in um, um, Paco, who is who works on your team in, um, in community engagement. Um, so welcome to the conversation, Paco. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. Great. So to address racial and ethnic disparities in prostate cancer, we know that your cancer center is implementing an outreach strategy that includes a mobile van to conduct PSA's testing in your community. So what are the goals for this outreach strategy to have mobile vehicles go out into, into the community to conduct PSA testing? Well, first off, these, these mobile units, which we, which we call the game changers, have been in place for several years. We've historically provided um, Health, health education, cancer prevention, 
and cancer screening um, through many communities throughout our catchment area, which includes Palm Beach County, Broward County, Miami-Dade, and Monroe. And we primarily provided screening and education th throughout these areas, as well as uh, engaging with individuals to link them to services that, that they need outside of what we can provide. So specifically for prostate cancer, we are, we are uh, launching an initiative this month in, in September, where we're engaging with community partners, working with them to identify areas where we can have the, the greatest impact in terms of reaching those high-risk men, black and brown men, and those that have a history of, of prostate cancer, and working with them to bring them into the, the mobile unit to be screened. Mm -hmm. And so are you aware of disparities in screening in your catchment area, uh, prostate cancer screening specifically? Yeah, yes, most definitely. And, and I think Dr. Mahal touched on that a little bit, and I can pitch it to him. Um, but yes, we, we are aware that approximately there's approximately 10% uh, lower uh, screening rates among individuals of uh, the lower social economic uh, status. So definitely that we are seeing that in our area. And Dr. Mahal, I don't know if you want to expand on that. Based yeah, on that's exactly correct. We, you know, we're we're seeing that in in uh, preliminary data. And I think just to to add some color to that, most of these men from lower SES backgrounds. Um, are are coming from you know populations that either self-identify as black or Latino and our Latino population here is is highly admixed and and there's a lot of West African ancestry in our Latino population. So these are men who should theoretically be getting screened more who are getting screened less. And so it, it's just um, you know a disparity that that can really lead to adverse outcomes. And so this sounds like an amazing opportunity to get folks to your um, to your cancer center and to get folks screened in the area that may not necessarily have access to screening. So what does success look like for this outreach strategy? Well, success looks um, looks very much like um, engaging with our community partners, having them uh, let us know what their needs are, where to go, where are the population, what, what's important to them. We're partnering with amazing individuals and agencies like um, uh, Zero Cancer. We're also working with the various organizations in the Southeast Florida Cancer Control Collab Collaborative and other partners that have historically worked very closely with the Cancer Center. And they are eyes and ears in the community. And they they work with us on everything from education to prevention and screening initiatives. So working closely with them, them guiding us in terms of our approach and making sure that we reach these men and have them A, get screened and, and have a warm handoff, so to speak, to, to uh, uh, a primary care clinic, an FQHC, et cetera, to make sure that they, they receive the care they need and, and continuity of care long term. And which is a great follow up to my to my next question, because, you know, I've been in this role for for about a year as the vice president of health equity at zero. Um, and, uh, you know, I consistently say that it's important to get folks screened to get men screened for prostate cancer. But we we have to recognize that not everyone has a usual or regular source of health care. So it's not enough to get screened. We have to actually have that what what you call the warm the warm handoff to a regular or usual source of health care. So how will this program uh, that you're implementing provide that follow up care after screening? Thank you for that question. Yes. Yeah, so we as part of our 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 protocol, we are as you know we're 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 partnering with Zero Cancers to uh, to facilitate some of those connections with local community agencies. We have partnered for many, many years with local federally qualified health centers. They know that we are launching this, so they um, will be ready to see some of these uh, individuals that need active uh, follow-up. And we're also gonna work closely with our partners in urology and the cancer center within the university to make sure that these, these individuals have referrals to care. Yeah. So, um... There's a saying from Oscar Robinson, he's a basketball legend and prostate cancer survivor that my colleague, Mr. Chris Bennett, told me about. Um, and this quote talks about the lack of preventative care or even knowledge about preventative care in minority communities. And he said, um, um, Oscar Robinson said, nobody knew about prostate cancer unless it killed them. 
whenever I hear that, it's like a, it's like a gut punch. Yeah. Um, the fact that we, we have really let many communities down in terms of, you know, education and awareness around prostate cancer. So obviously we have so much work to do on increasing education and, and awareness. And so is that also, you know, part of this, this outreach strategy to increase education and awareness? Education piece, in my opinion, is as important as screening, if not more important, because nobody's going to go to get screened unless they even know they have to get screened or that they're at risk of being screened. So this webinar is one of those ways of educating these individuals at highest risk. We are working with local churches, um, barbershops, and, and other areas that, uh, so we can engage with them and provide additional educational activities. I'll be working with Dr. Mahal on these events to be going on long-term into the future to make sure we we get out there, we share the information with those that need it. Yeah. And as you mentioned, uh, you'll be partnering with, with us here at Zero, the end of prostate cancer. Um, and we have an initiative that, that we hope will also be helpful uh, in this effort. So we have um, our Black Men's Prostate Cancer Initiative, which includes a support group specifically for, for Black men. And we're also um, in conversations to talk about, you know, uh, so that um, support group is virtual and it meets uh, twice a month on the first and, or uh, sorry, on the second and fourth Monday of the month. Um, and we're also in conversations with your group about sort of working through, do we need an in-person support group in the area that, that Zero can support? Uh, we also have a podcast that's part of our Black Men's Prostate Cancer Initiative. Um, and actually our uh, virtual support group is led by uh, two, it's, was historically led by two men, but now only only one one man is still uh, a leader of that group. But those two individuals were uh, licensed are licensed mental health practitioners, and so they mentioned to us that um, they don't have a background in prostate cancer, but by in leading this group, um, it is informing their mental health practice with other black men and sort of helping them to navigate the healthcare delivery system. So we talk about those spillover effects mm -hmm. of you know what it means to be a, um, a support a support group leader. So we also have a, a um, prostate cancer uh, in the Black community film series that we're launching first in Atlanta, and then we'll be looking for other places uh, to do that. So that could also be part of the, you know, many of the conversations that we're going to have in terms of the ways in which we can collaborate uh, and, so, and support your effort here at Zero. And we also have um, um, many education and awareness um, materials that we're providing uh, um, as you go out in the community that you can share with community members um, about um, prostate cancer from sort of, you know, what is the prostate to sort of questions to ask your ask your doctor. So all of those informations are, all of that information is available uh, on our website at zerocancer.org. So as we wrap up, um, Addressing disparities can be challenging, and many of us are committed to, you know, eliminating health disparities with the goal of achieving health equity. That is where everyone has a fair and just opportunity to prevent, find, uh, detect, treat, and survive prostate cancer. But the specific steps to do that can be uncertain. So, um, so for for Paco and Dr. Mahal and your community engagement team, what do you recommend for patients and healthcare providers in the community? to do to help your group in this outreach effort. Paco, would you like me to go first? Yes, go ahead. Thank All you. right, so, you know, I would say breaking it down again, your questions by patient providers and communities. I think for patients and, and community members in general, the number one thing is, is to first, you know, really raise awareness and, and to, um, as much as we can, um, become educated on these topics. And, and a, lot, a lot of that has, uh, is is pinned back on on what providers can do as well, which is in healthcare systems is is to to come together and meet communities where they're at, partner with organizations such as this partnership we have between the University of Miami Sylvester and Zero Cancer, and go to the community and and meet the community where they are, hold events where they are, um, gain that trust, share information, and really start to spread that information. I think. You know, uh, again, patients and community members, when you when you hear uh, talks like this that we're giving at this webinar, or when you come to an event, please share that information with your family, share it with your loved ones, tell them to get screened. You know, a lot of cancers that we have good screening for prostate, breast, uh, cervical, colorectal, though, if you do uh, adequate screening and catch anything that's early, 
Um, I know there can be a lot of fear about that. I, I grew up myself personally in a, a, a poor uh, neighborhood and, and I didn't have great health literacy growing up. My family didn't. We, we were very afraid of going to the doctor, but these, these uh, steps um, with screening in particular can help us catch cancers early when they're curable and when they don't become a problem. And, and it can really, you know, ultimately help you live longer. And so the, get that message out to the, the people you care about that you love, take yourself to the doctor, get preventative care. You know, as you were bringing up that quote from Oscar Robinson, really the most important thing is to, to have preventative care, to have a primary care that you can go and see and, and ask questions, ask about your risk, ask about, um, you know, these different diseases you might hear about. It's always good to ask you these questions and be your best uh, self-advocate. And again, on the institution side, we have heavy weight to carry. We haven't done a good job of, of getting out there and, and sharing the information and getting our boots on the ground. And that's what I, I you know, I, why I'm so proud to be working with, with everybody here, Paco and Reggie, especially because we're doing just that. We're, we're, we're going to be getting our boots on the ground, doing screening events and raising awareness. And, and that's the type of commitment that institutions and healthcare systems need to have. Marco, anything to add to that? Yeah, that's a tough act to follow, but I just want to echo Dr. Mahal's uh, comments. You know, I think general awareness and open dialogue about prostate cancer is key. You know, family sh should discuss it. The partners of these um, men should should encourage their encourage them to be screened, encourage them to to learn more about prostate cancer, and and have these individuals advocate for themselves. You know engage with their clinician, ask questions. If they can engage with their clinician, they should um, attend some of these screening events, whether they're ours or others. It's just critical that they are aware of their status and take proper action in terms of primary care and or um, engaging with a specialist and to follow up their care long-term. So, and regarding our, our outreach efforts, whatever feedback, uh, whatever is needed from the community, we're there to make it happen. So um, we are here to serve the community and make sure that their needs are met. So we we look forward to engaging with the community working with Zero Cancer to make sure that um, we spread the word about prostate cancer and engage with the community in, in a meaningful way. Great. Well, I want to thank you both for engaging with us in this in this conversation. We look forward to a, to a great partnership and supporting your community engagement efforts there at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center with um, all of our resources and support um, uh, materials here at Zero. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.